All right, well, we have a packed agenda, so we're going to go ahead and get started as promised at 2.01 Eastern Standard Time. Hello, everyone. I'm Julia Vastine. I'm with Dickinson College's Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring. It is my privilege to chair the National Water Quality Monitoring Council's Volunteer Monitoring Work Group. The National Water Quality Monitoring Council was created in 1998 and is currently managed by the Environmental Protection Agency. The council serves as an informational resource seeking to advance the monitoring community through collaboration and information exchange. In 2016, the council approved the creation of the Volunteer Monitoring Work Group with the goal to better integrate volunteer monitoring activities with ongoing water quality monitoring conducted by local, state, federal, and tribal entities. Now I'm going to pass the microphone over to Rebecca Bond with Oklahoma Conservation Commission, who chairs the webinar subcommittee to kick us off. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Thanks for being with us today. Um, for 2022, our subcommittee uh, landed on the, the theme of data use for the webinar series. This is the last of four webinars for 2022. And today we're going to shine a spotlight on the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative, who will discuss regional, state, and local data use. We will have 40 minutes of presentations, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Please write your questions in the chat, and Stephanie Letourneau, or I will respond to your questions. Stephanie, like Julie, is from Alarm. So we have four speakers today, Liz Chidoba um, with the Alliance of the Chesapeake Bay, Peter Tango with the US Geological Survey, the Chesapeake Bay Program, Sam Briggs of the Isaac Walton League of America, and Julie Vastine, Dickinson College's Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring. And with that, I am gonna hand it over to Liz. Hey everybody, thank you so much for that great introduction, Rebecca and Julie. We're really excited to chat with everybody today about the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative and all that we have been doing across the Chesapeake Bay region uh, to facilitate community and volunteer-based data being used at the regional, state, and local levels. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative and where we started. Peter will give a regional perspective on how the data is used at the Bay Program. Sam will give a perspective on how it is used at the state level. And Julie will bring us home with those local data use um, examples. So to jump off, I'm going to pass it over to Peter to give a little background about how the CMC got started. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. And I'm going to jump in here with... Uh, Working with the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership, I'm the Chesapeake Bay Monitoring Coordinator. I've been working at this position for almost 20 years and a water quality monitoring coordinator with the state of Maryland for a decade before that. So I've been around the Chesapeake Bay for a while and there's a lot of work done on the restoration side where we are concerned about assessment. How do we build our environmental intelligence? How do we apply the data that we have? Where can we make better use of data that's available? And um, really trying to assess and communicate how the impact of management actions are, are shaping the community, shaping the restoration. What's the status of our waterways in the watershed as well as the bay? Can we detect change effectively? And we're always looking to separate fact from fiction about what the condition is versus what people think the condition might be. We use the data or the variety of data sets to confront models with data. And we love when we see model understanding connect up with the patterns in the data, but we also look for gaps where we see those two diverge. So it's a high value, high value products there. And that all plays into our adaptive management support for adaptive monitoring, where we are constantly trying to update our programs, make better use of resources, and then uh, see how we can better assess the, the changes that are going on, as well as target resources for restoration activities strategically. With that in mind, uh, the Chesapeake Bay program, the, the 1980s saw a major study to understand and characterize the Bay's water quality and found that it was degraded. In 1984, EPA's Chesapeake Bay program was formed and the water quality monitoring program was launched. Uh, this 
EPA state grant supported program has over 150 locations in the tidally monitored portion of the Bay. And that's been pretty steady throughout the entire period, nearly 40 years now, a real tribute to the history of investment and concern for the data and an understanding of how our investment in, in management actions is improving conditions uh, throughout the Bay and its watershed. But it wasn't until 2003 that water quality criteria were actually published. And this was to give us an understanding of what is it specifically that we need to protect the Bay living resources? What's our best understanding for those targets so that we have an understanding of what we're aiming for in uh, not only giving, giving the water quality to create the habitat to help our living resources survive, grow, and reproduce. And yet, with, that, with those criteria, there was an evaluation in this document in 2003 that published the criteria that looked at our monitoring program designed in the 80s for really annual and seasonal level status and trend understanding and uh, evaluated it as deemed fair for gaps in terms of assessing the criteria. During 2007 to 2009, there was a review of the monitoring program with this in mind about what do we need how do we get more resources based on available funding? How do we better improve? And what's out there that we might not be using? And in that particular process, the two-year process that ended in 2009, our report showed that there were about 270 additional programs that we could document in fisheries, benthic monitoring, water quality monitoring, all these activities that were going on that were not part of our daily interaction and, uh, and, and ability to use the data to help explain change through time and understand our progress. So next slide. We recognized that with the abundance of programs out there, the force that is among community scientists, the many programs that were involved, uh, there was an effort to develop a proposal that would be funded to develop this community science program that would sync up with needs of the Bay program, help in ways that we understood to better fill gaps in our data collections. And with the application of those data, see an improved understanding of the Bay and watershed health that could help with the decision support. By the end of 2015, an award was made after that proposal was accepted within EPA and funding put behind it. And Lo and behold, the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative was born, and I've been a technical advisor to this group ever since. I'm going to turn it over to Liz now, who is the project officer. Thank you, Liz. Take it away. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for that background on how, how everything got started before the CMC was actually um, the CMC. So I'll take over now uh, to lay out the foundation. Um, so when we started in 2015, it was through the cooperative agreement between the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and the Chesapeake Bay program. And the um, CMC started with a core development team and partners, including the Isaac Walton League of America, the Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring at Dick College, and the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Um, and we were really four core partner organizations that laid the foundation, pulled together quality assurance project plans, standard operating procedures to try to define the scope of what could be um, brought into the CMC network across the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Well, the goal was to integrate and bring together all of these diverse community and volunteer-based monitoring programs across the watershed and be able to compare data between all of these very diverse groups. Um, and then VIMS has come on later as a partner. They're now one of our core development team partners running our Chesapeake Data Explorer, which is our centralized data hub. And I will talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, so just to give you a brief uh, overview of our organizational structure. Each of the, the core partner teams or service providers, as we call them, work with different types of monitoring programs in different regions throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So the CMC works with benthic macroinvertebrate monitoring groups and water quality monitoring groups, chemical, collecting chemical and physical and sometimes biological data. And each of our service provider organizations has an expertise in either benthic 
and or water quality monitoring and works in different regions. So Alarm works in Pennsylvania and New York with both benthic and chemical groups. The Alliance works in the southern part of the watershed with water quality monitoring groups and Isaac Walton League works with the benthic monitoring groups in the lower part of the watershed. And all of this data comes together into our centralized Chesapeake Data Explorer where it is publicly accessible to anybody throughout the world who wants to look at or use this data. It's available to the state agencies in all seven Bay jurisdictions and gets uploaded to the Chesapeake Bay Program Data Hub, where it can then be integrated into the various work groups um, throughout the Chesapeake Bay Program. So it was a long process to get CMC started, obviously working on a scale across seven jurisdictions at the um, and, and throughout the whole Chesapeake Bay watershed was a major feat. So as we said, we started in 2015 and really tried to set the foundation in those first two to three years of the projects. We had to formalize the quality assurance project plans, pull together standard operating procedures and figure out a way and start the development of our data explorer and figure out a way to really work with where all of the groups currently were within the Chesapeake um, region. A lot of the groups have been monitoring for decades and we didn't want to come in and wholeheartedly change programs that had been fully functional and um, very active for that long of a period of time. So we really had to figure out how to make data accessible across the region and comparable while working within the structures that were already in existence. So in 2017, we really started doing the outreach and working with monitoring groups and doing the on -to the ground work to start integrating data into the data explorer. And that has just accelerated and built every year since then. Um, and then in 2018, we also had a big success in uh, signing an unprecedented memorandum of understanding where all seven Bay jurisdictions within the Chesapeake Bay watershed and that participate in the Chesapeake Bay program signed an MOU really forging a deeper understanding and commitment to the use of community-based monitoring throughout the region um, and really acknowledging that bringing together all of this data in one centralized place with the structures that we had in place was really beneficial for everybody involved. Um, and then throughout the rest of the years, we've really just been focusing on working with all of the individual monitoring groups, reviewing all of their quality assurance processes and paperwork and integrating that data to Data Explorer. And now we are in um, our second six-year cooperative agreement. So the first cooperative agreement ended in 2021, and we started the new six-year cooperative agreement in 2021, which will go through 2027. And then, as I mentioned, our crown jewel of the CMC, the thing that really brings all of this data together is our Chesapeake Data Explorer. This is a centralized data hub where everybody who's collecting data that has been, um, that has worked with a service provider and has been assessed by the CMC team can upload their data to the Data Explorer. And right now we have just about 683,000 data including benthic and that chemical water quality monitoring data at 2,800 stations across the Bay. And we have data in all seven Bay jurisdictions right now. Um, so this is just really a great tool that people can use to kind of see their data in connection with the other monitoring groups um, collecting data throughout the Bay watershed. There are some basic data visualizations. So if you click on any one of these sites, it pulls up a little box that shows you what data is being collected and um, little graphs that show you uh, the trends over time. And then just to kind of highlight before we jump into the 
the specific data use stories, I want to highlight some of the key um, unexpected outcomes of bringing data together on a regional scale like this. So we were able to have the opportunity to partner with Booz Allen Hamilton and their women in data science team and their 901 green office teams in 2020 in order to host a hackathon. And it was supposed to be on Earth Day in 2020, but we all know what happened then. So we ended up postponing it to the fall of 2020 and held a virtual hackathon. So for those of you who don't know what a hackathon is, which I did not when we started this process, um, it's a place for data scientists to come together and work on um, solving data issues. Um, and it's everybody's in a room kind of working through different models and different data science um, processes. Um, and so we had to really rethink how that works and uh, format it for a virtual format. So we actually ran it over uh, five weeks in September of 2020. And it was a great opportunity because it actually gave folks more than just one day to work on and think through. Projects. So this is just really highlighting a, a really important example. This is the first time that the data set was actually being analyzed as a whole across the region, um, which is a really exciting, um, really exciting place to start with. And I will say we only had actually about a hundred thousand data points in our in our data explorer when this happened. So we learned a lot in this process and um, we answered a lot of questions. It was ne not necessarily groundbreaking um, it, answers that we got to a lot of the questions, but we learned that we need to have a lot more specific questions that we're asking and give a lot more details and specific data sets that we want people to um, analyze. And also it just gave us different ways to think about the data and different gives a, it gave us different perspectives on how to how to look at our data and, and what challenges we face uh, in the Chesapeake watershed. And then I just wanna highlight some future additional data uses, again, that are coming about in because we have built this network and we're able to leverage the work that's being done across the watershed. Um, we've built out a benthic sampling protocol that's filling in specific gaps in the Chesapeake um, Index of Biological Integrity, uh, which looks at benthic macroinvertebrate samples uh, analyzed to the family level. So there's a lot of watersheds that have no data collected whatsoever, where we already have volunteers out um, collecting data. And so we can add these data points to, um, to, that, to that data set to fill in those data gaps. And then additionally, we are currently um, working on a NIFWIF restoration protocol that again will leverage the work done by the, the community science community um, throughout the Bay Watershed and kind of leverage efforts of volunteer monitoring with tracking restoration practices over time with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, so with that and the background in place, I am going to turn it over to Peter again to kind of give some of those more specific details about how data is used at the Bay Program level. Thank you, Liz. And um, so a little, little insight into some of the work that has already happened with, the, uh, with what you can find in the Chesapeake Data Explorer. Uh, recently, there was a one and a half year workshop that was looking at rising water temperatures, the issue of rising water temperatures, what information we had, what evidence do we have, and the uh, part of the temperature data set that was developed to look at these issues was included from what was drawn out of the Chesapeake Data Explorer. So we're seeing evidence of research support that was underpinning some of the explorations that were done for this scientific workshop. It's a reference, people may explore it further, but it points to how people are starting to use that, how the research community is looking at the data, and at least whether it's filling in model estimations, calibration, verification, exploration, it's all uh, something that we were able to see in the research support with, with that in the last couple of years through this particular workshop as one example. 
On water quality standards attainment assessment, there are groups that wanted to elevate their programs to align with what was going on for the regulatory assessments. And uh, that was their basically reaching out to us and saying, given the understanding of this tiered approach that we put in place, if they wanted to achieve that with their programs, we were providing that outline of what it would need, what they would need for the, the QA, the QC, the type of documentation, the type of reporting. And there are several groups that have reported on dissolved oxygen, salinity, and temperature data back to the Chesapeake Bay program through the CMC that's being used for indicator reporting and now regulatory water quality standards attainment assessments. A uh, real interesting item that we're writing up the case study for in the coming months is that uh, we just completed some comparisons between in places that we have both the historical data and now the new data that includes community science. There are several segments in the bay that you see colored over there that uh, are actually showing conditions that appear to be better as a function of having more data in those particular regions. So very complementary, and not to say that every case where we have more data, we're gonna see better conditions, but it's nice to see the initial outputs. So uh, we look forward to presenting more on that when we have uh, completed that write-up. And then Liz was just speaking to this restoration goal evaluation. Uh, within the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership, there have been a history of agreements. And the most recent agreement, the 24, 2014 Watershed Agreement, has 10 goals, 31 outcomes. One of those is stream health assessment and has recovery targets. Um, as Liz mentioned, there are gaps in the assessment in terms of the distribution. While there are tens of thousands of data points over the course of a six-year period that forms the assessment period, and they're contributed from county government, state government, federal government, academic institutions. It's really a collaborative effort. And now there's additional work being done to help fill in gaps in both space and time assessments that we're, are feeding into this stream health assessment to look at status and recovery trajectories. So uh, those are kind of three region-wide places where we're already seeing the Chesapeake monitoring cooperative data plug in for a variety of important needs within the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnerships work. And from here, I will turn it over to Sam Briggs. Thank you, Peter. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Briggs. Uh, I'm the Clean Water Program Director at the Isaac Walton League. And a lot of our focus uh, within the water quality world is with benthic monitoring. So my example of state data use is going to be around our Virginia Save Our Streams program. Uh, Virginia Save Our Streams is a volunteer benthic macroinvertebrate monitoring program. Um, we train our monitors through a certification program how to ID benthic uh, macroinvertebrates down to order and species level, um, and that stream side ID. So they're pulling the bugs out of the stream after a set protocol, IDing them, and releasing them live back into the stream. Uh, this protocol was adapted from our national Save Our Streams protocol that's been around for, you know, dozens of years, almost 50 at this point. Um, and it was adapted by Dr. Reese Foschel at Virginia Tech um, with his grad students to more suit the Chesapeake Bay region. So it's a more specific protocol that requires a little bit more training and more specific metrics that allow that data to better mirror the state collected benthic data. So this program, uh, it's been ongoing for over 20 years at this point. Um, we have over 400 active and newly certified monitors, 30 regional trainers, um, and 371 sites as of last week. Um, those 30 trainers are from our partner organizations. So uh, Virginia Save Our Streams lives and dies through our partner organizations um, that, you know, invest their time and resources into monitoring in their region as well. Next slide. Uh, so at the state level, um, our Virginia Save Our Streams data is considered level two data. At the CMC tiered level, that's level one. Um, so that's to the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality for their integrated report, so their 305B report. Um, the level two data is used primarily to identify waters for follow-up sampling. Um, so what we do is we submit our data to them twice a year. Um, if a site scores in the unacceptable or gray zone category, 
um, based on the benthic populations we found, it's placed in a priority list through DEQ. So their state biologists can perform that follow-up sampling. Um, depending on uh, their staffing shortages at the time, they, they like to get to that site within two years so they can identify sites that need restoration um, or to be listed. Um, so here's an example of our latest data that we have coming in um, over land use, and you can see that the more urban areas with more impervious surface tend to have worse water quality scores, and that's probably not surprising to anyone on this call. Um, next slide. So here's an example of our data set in 2011. Um, this is where we started pulling in really robust data from our monitors across the state. You can see we had a lot of folks um, along the Shenandoah Mountains as well as Northern Virginia. And then we'll compare that to the next slide, which is our 2021 data set. And you can see we're starting to sprinkle in and expand our breath a little bit. Um, and we're starting to creep east towards the Richmond area and the Piedmont region. Um, so our goal moving forward is to um, expand as well and fill more of those data gaps so we can identify those sites for follow-up monitoring. Next slide. Um, and I wanted to give a couple other examples of how this data is used beyond just prioritizing for follow-up monitoring by the state. Um, the first is that it's used to help track local TMDL implementation. Um, so an example of that is there was part of the Middle River that was um, listed as an impaired waterway, and that was actually delisted in 2018. Um, so our folks at Friends of the Middle River, one of our great partners, um, you can see there we have Pete and Phil, they're two of our Virginia Save Our Streams trainers, getting folks out there monitoring. Um, they worked hard to get uh, folks monitoring in the region so that our data could be a baseline and inform these TMDL activities. Um, so it was listed for E. coli and sediment, but our benthic monitoring data helps inform these overall um, water quality impairments to ensure that the stream was indeed improving across the board. Next slide. Um, and then finally, I like to highlight this one. While it's not a traditional data use, so to speak, in terms of us handing over a spreadsheet so our data could be used by the state, um, I want to point out that our monitors really are the eyes and ears of their stream. So they're getting out to regions where there's not a state biologist accessing that stream on a regular basis. They're hitting those smaller tributaries that are not necessarily prioritized for monitoring. And as a result, they can highlight red flags for environmental issues that they're seeing in their region. Um, an example of that is we had monitors with the Goose Creek Association in Northern Virginia, um, and they went to their stream site that they had been monitoring for years. They got acceptable readings across the board, and then they noticed tons of sewage. It smelled like sewage. There was toilet paper in their stream, and they walked along their stream site and noticed that a sewage pipe was malfunctioning, and it was just flowing sewage straight into their stream where it should have been a closed pipe. Um, so they were able to notify Virginia DEQ and the health department to get that problem solved quickly. Um, this wasn't you know, a stream site in a public park where lots of folks were accessing it. So without our monitors getting out there and taking note and visually assessing their stream, uh, that problem could have gone unnoticed for weeks, um, creating, you know, a huge amount of water quality issues down the road and human health impacts. Next slide. So up next for Virginia Save Our Streams, we have a staff person, um, Kira, who is our Save Our Streams coordinator in the Mid-Atlantic, Kira Carney. Uh, she is our primary trainer. She's training new trainers and new monitors across the state year round. Um, and so we're working with groups aiming for local and regional water quality improvements. Um, so not only are we getting folks out there monitoring, but we're also um, encouraging folks to be advocates in their communities. Um, and we're hoping in the future, as we work with CMC, to expand our breadth and also uh, move some more sites and monitors across the state. So you can see here that the active monitors pre-2021 are in gray, and then we're filling in with new certified monitors in green in 2022. And we're hoping to see that fill in even more where you see gaps. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Julie Bastine at Alarm, who will be highlighting local data use examples. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, as uh, was mentioned before, I'm Julie Vastine and I direct Dickinson College's Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring, or ALARM. And ALARM is the Pennsylvania and New York Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative Partner. Before we move on to the next slide, I do want to call out two people on this slide. Uh, first is Phoebe Galeone in the black ALARM shirt. Uh, Phoebe is our outreach manager and she's going to be dropping in links to different materials in the chat uh, that correspond with these next slides. And I also want to highlight Stephanie Letourneau, who is next to Vivi in this picture, who is our community science manager who coordinates our Pennsylvania Stream Team program, which I will discuss on the next slide. So ALARM, ooh, we're missing a slide. ALARM, like many projects across the country, has a monitoring program called Stream Team. Liz, can we see if my missing slide is up next? Hmm. Try going to the next one. Ah, okay. We'll need to go back to the slide before this. Okay. So anyway, getting back to it, Alarm, like many projects across this country, has a monitoring program called Stream Team because who does not like a name that rhymes? And in 2016, CNC went through an extensive prioritization process throughout the watershed to identify needs that data collected by volunteer scientists could help fill. In Pennsylvania, there were a number of priorities, including increasing data coverage in the tributaries draining into the Susquehanna River, among other, other topics like getting additional sites in areas with high agricultural land use and, and a number of things that go along with it. Uh, in response to this and looking across the landscape and seeing the need for additional data to be collected, ALARM collaborated with the lower and middle Susquehanna River keepers, Penn State Master, Penn State Master Watershed Stewards, and a subset of the county conservation districts, as well as volunteer scientists, to develop the stream team study design. And since 2019, we have engaged 150 volunteers at 82 sites in 10 counties generating close to 15,000 data points. And while we're here, uh, any stream team volunteers, we saw you in the participant list, um, as well as Joyce for Center County. Uh, can you please introduce yourselves in the chat? Maybe throw in there your name, county, creek, and the years that you've monitored. All right, we'll go back to the slide before this, Liz. Um, so, one of the questions we have when we're thinking about local data use and leveraging the power of communities and the power of science is how do you transition from data collection to data interpretation? And, uh, you know, in doing this, um, Alarm, we're continually exploring avenues to engage volunteer scientists in all steps in the scientific process. And in 2003, we had a wake up call around data use. Our founder and science advisor, Dr. Candy Wilderman, was contracted by a local watershed association to analyze their data that they had collected and develop a report and a presentation. So Candy did that. She implemented the deliverables, she shared them with the group, and when she she asked the group how they were going to use the data. They in turn said they wanted her to use the data. And she was just like, people, these are your data. These are your data stories. And the volunteers went on to say that they would not be confident and comfortable in presenting the findings. This experience led Alarm to think through steps to facilitate data understanding. And as a result, we developed data interpretation workshops because we have found that volunteers are the best data storytellers because these are their data and they live in the communities where they are using their data. Before we skip to like the two slides down, I just want to highlight Tim, or Tina and Jeff Gleim who are in this photo. Uh, they're two monitoring rock stars from York County and I believe are on today's webinar, and they have developed some of the most uh, amazing do-it-yourself tools to assist the monitoring process, and recently co-presented with the CMC team at the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Forum. All right, Liz, we can move on to, I think, now two slides. All right, so uh, Phoebe and Stephanie are going to be doing a workshop at the National Monitoring Conference in April, Virginia Beach, Virginia, plug there, on our data interpretation process and how to facilitate that with your group. So I'm not going to go into these details too much, but we're going to talk through the steps pretty 
pretty quickly. So the first step is data entry and cleaning. So volunteers input their data from their data sheets, data sheets that are held on to for seven years, according to our quality assurance project plan. And they take those data and put it into the data explorer. And then from there on an annual basis, Phoebe downloads the data from the data explorer from our sites that have a minimum of a year's worth of data to begin the data cleaning process. In step two, we develop data packets, and we can move on to that next slide, uh, which hopefully Phoebe will be able to drop a link to um, in the chat. Uh, and uh, in 2022, this year, we developed 62 site packets. That's why that document is so big. Um, and the site packets include uh, raw, summarized, and visualized data comparable to what you're seeing on the screen. And then we've also developed a series of GIS maps to assist with the data interpretation process. And then also within GIS, I'm sure many of you are aware, you can create that watershed delineation tool that where you can then further categorize the percentage of land use, geology, et cetera, of the landscape draining into a monitor site. So all of that is included in the data packets. So after we put the data packets together and we've shared them with our fantastic volunteer scientists, then we move into exploring water quality influencers. Um, so this is a webinar that we do um, to kind of set the, it's a primer. Um, so we explore uh, the different, different water quality influencers that could help with the interpretations. And then we also spend some time talking about state standards as well as the designated uses um, to help add some additional context to the data that they have been collecting. After this webinar, then it's time for the volunteers to do their interpretation. And to assist with this, we provide our volunteers with a series of worksheet, worksheets um, that include questions that strategically build upon each other to help facilitate that data discovery process. And then we host office hours for volunteer teams uh, to review their findings. Um, and this year we had eight teams attend office hours out of the 62. And then in the last and final step, uh, using PowerPoint templates that we've provided to the volunteers, the volunteers summarized their findings. Um, 10 teams uh, did presentations this year. And one of the things I love about this is everyone is always adding in their observations from their monitoring sites. So for example, the Griebers here, uh, Jane and Randy, um, they, they have a site along the Appalachian Trail that is just absolutely gorgeous. And they highlight that it, the Virginia Bluebells uh, bloom in April, and it is quite gorgeous to see. The other thing I'll point out, and I believe David Moyer is on our webinar today, um, he takes the best pictures of the flora and fauna at his site, which seems to be a birder's paradise, which can lead to another potential data use of folks coming out and witnessing fun wildlife that isn't usually seen in these parts, which uh, David has seen some birds that you don't expect to usually find in York County. All right, so let's move into those data use um, and data stories and then data use. Uh, so these are the next few slides, again, are pulled from the presentations that the volunteers did themselves in June. Um, and we're going to start with uh, Judy Sam Samler and uh, Gary Lender. Um, and one of the things I really loved about their presentation is they not only used the year and a half worth of data that they had collected, um, but seeing some of the trends that they were finding in the data they collected, they went and sought out additional data. And it just so happens that the watershed where they monitor happens to have a USGS gauging station, um, which is just fantastic. And they brought that into their findings. And so one of the things that they identified is climate change might may be affecting their stream. And that is a consistent storyline that we have seen across the stream team landscape. Um, we have approximately a dozen stream team sites um, that have discovered that their stream temperature measurements violate state standards for their designated use. 
Um, we have learned from our volunteer scientists that they have reported these findings at watershed association meetings, at county commissioner meetings, as well as municipality meetings, raising awareness about the impact of climate change, as well as the need for localities to have resiliency plans in place. Um, with our next slide, we're going to go to your county, uh, to a stream, Mill Creek, that drains into the Cadoras, uh, and it is monitored by Latisse Brown and Mark Lenz. During their time monitoring, a significant road construction project was taking place next to their site, and they've been monitoring since the very end of 2018, and so they've seen the site through the seasons, they know what it looks like, and it just so happened that we had a hurricane come through the area in September of 2021, and they went out to their site to take pictures, not to monitor, because safety first. Um, and uh, not only did they witness how the site was flooding, but they also observed significant erosion connected to the road construction pro project. Latisse just so happens to be the city of York's MS4 uh, coordinator, multiple separate storm sewer systems coordinator, and reported it to the city and uh, remediation measures um, were implemented. And Mark and Latisse continued to observe the construction process throughout the subsequent months of monitoring and noted the positive impact of increased erosion and sedimentation control measures uh, on controlling the sedimentation at the site. In our last example, I'm gonna end with a common data use. I, I imagine all of us who are practitioners and project coordinators have seen, and that is pollution screening. Um, so we're gonna look at an example um, from Sean Lavery and Cindy Pizzichetti, also in York County. And their site just so happens to be downstream of a point discharge. Now, in the first few months of uh, being a stream team volunteer scientist, Cindy observed this weird color of discharge coming from the pipe and took pictures, got readings, and sent this information out to folks. Um, she notified her local master watershed steward coordinator. She notified alarm. She also contacted the lower Susquehanna Riverkeeper, um, which led to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection being contacted. And it was found that the site was indeed in violation of its National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, or NIPTES, permit. And an order of consent was filed in August of 2020. So uh, thinking through these three examples and thinking through the diverse uses of data at the local level, these are just three examples. And on the next slide, we have a list of a brainstorm that the CMC team has come up with. But these particular examples are amplifying the impacts of climate change, discovering faulty erosion and sedimentation control measures. They're doing pollution screening. Um, and in addition to that, um, the CMC team has spent some time brainstorming some different diverse ways that we've also seen the data being used locally. Um, so we've seen many use from personal growth, from scientific literacy being enhanced, to folks doing community presentations and for civic groups, um, to also identifying sites for restoration. And I'll conclude with saying, as time and time again as a service provider, I am just in awe of the dedication of our volunteer scientists collaborators. It is such a unique honor and privilege. And I imagine the other coordinators feel this as well. And this speaks to something that Sam was saying in her presentation. It's such a unique honor and privilege to work with individuals committed to doing watershed scientists or watershed science. Volunteer scientists are helping us understand the health of our local streams, and they're continually demonstrating that they are the most effective eyes, ears, and voices of our waterways. So to our volunteers in attendance and our volunteers in attendance in person, or in spirit, I applaud you. And with that, we'll conclude with a slide with our contact information, which we'll keep up for a little bit. We can also drop this into the chat. And I will turn it over to Stephanie Letourneau and Rebecca Bond to help facilitate our Q&A. All right, awesome. So our first question, um, and please feel free to keep putting them in the chat. Um, our first question, Peter got started with answering it. 
but it's about physical access to the sites that monitors are at. So are many of these sites on private property? If so, must owner permissions um, to access the site be obtained or are all or most of the sites on publicly accessible land? So um, Liz or Julie or Sam, do you wanna start off? Yeah, I can start off with um, answering this question and then other folks can hop in with their take on it too. Um, so for the most part, it depends. It depends on the individual monitoring program who's collecting the data. As Peter mentioned in the chat box, a lot of our title programs are based on collecting mid-channel depth profile samples from those tidal waterways in which they're collecting from a boat and don't necessarily have to deal with those privacy um, concerns. It's public open waters. However, in more of our non-tidal streams, it really depends on the goal of the monitoring project. So a few projects um, focus on bacteria monitoring at uh, public access places. So all of those um, sites are going to be located where people are recreating, people are contacting the water, and things like that. But other sites, um, other programs like our River Trends program run through the Alliance, focus more on baseline monitoring throughout the year. And we do have some sites that are located on private property because somebody is interested either in a specific neighborhood because the kids are playing there or um, because they're interested on their own property for some reason and wanna know what the water quality is. So it really, it truly just depends on the goal of each monitoring program. And we work with each of the programs to identify what those local goals are, what those local data needs are in order to identify the best sites that would be suitable for monitoring. And if sites are located on private property, we do have landowner permission forms to make sure that we always have access to those sites. Um, for all of the monitoring activities and everybody is aware of what is occurring on their sites. So I'll open it up to Julie or Sam to jump in if there's anything I missed on that one. No, I mean, I think you're you're hitting the nail on the head with like each program takes things a slightly different way. And I just guess to maybe touch on another question or comment that came uh, in the chat about the coordination of efforts. Um, so for example, like when we're going, when we're starting a new county for stream team, um, the first thing that we do is we look and see what are the existing monitoring stations in place. Um, so that could be university partners, it could be SRBC, uh, Susquehanna River Basin Commission gauging stations, it could be other partners at play, get them into the room and identify where the, where are their sites in the watersheds that need additional data, or, and, and we try to triangulate those efforts. And I will say at, at Alarm, in part because this is, is a lesson learned from um, doing fracking monitoring, a program that we have since closed, we always emphasize public prop property first. Um, so I think like that is a pretty common way that it happens uh, in both Pennsylvania and New York, but also following up on what Liz said, like, you know, there are folks that will want to monitor streams going through their own backyard. Yeah, and just to add to that, for the benthics, um, because our streams need to be weightable, like below knee height weightable, that already limits where we have access. Um, we have a, a bunch of monitors that actually do monitor their own property and got involved because they were concerned about the water quality on their own property. And then a lot of our partner groups have existing stream sites that they are consistently monitoring and wanting that continuity of that data set. And so they're working on replacing volunteers should someone retire or move away um, and they're letting up that stream site. So we have a mix of public and private. Um, and one of the things that uh, we just make sure is that they're getting the proper permissions. It's either through that private landowner permission slip or if it's like a county park or something, they meet, may need additional permissions as well. Awesome, thanks guys. And on this topic, I do see another question that I wanna make sure that we hit and that's how um, we standardize all of the data coming in from different groups. Um, is there one general co-op or individual co-ops for each group? And this is a great question that I kind of touched on, but didn't go into a whole lot of detail on. So 
the way this works, and it's a little bit different within each of the jurisdictions, um, which is one of our big challenges of working across seven different jurisdictions who do things a little differently. So we have one umbrella co-op that um, was approved by EPA. We have one for non-tidal waters, tidal waters, and benthic water quality monitoring. So we have three co-ops that function that serve the CMC. And those act as the framework and, I, and um, determining the realm of parameters and um, the scope of where data can be collected within the CMC network. So all of the different parameters that we monitor, the different types of monitoring, some recommendations on equipment and methodologies and things like that to make sure everybody's at least following the standards. And it sets the baseline of what the quality assurance needs to be in order to be accepted into the CMC system. So people can kind of still tweak their particular program as much as needed, as long as they meet the minimum requirements to meet the state to, to, for the quality assurance standards for that piece of equipment. Um, in some states, like in Virginia, the state agency also does um, approve individual co-ops for all of the monitoring programs. So they have a robust uh, grant program and do actually also have individual co-ops that are approved for each organization that monitors in Virginia. Um, but really the goal of the CMC was to start creating these standardized quality assurance project plans so that the groups that are not submitting data for the assessment purposes those groups have to have their own individual co-ops, um, but for the majority of groups across the Bay Watershed, we're trying to reduce that barrier of having to write a very technical co-op for a handful of sites that a group might be monitoring in one small region. We've really created the structures and framework to help them collect robust data without having to take that additional step. Yeah, and I just have to say, like, I'm going to dovetail on this, Liz, because we're very, 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 very proud of our idea around having the umbrella co-ops, um, because it does increase data access in those states that do not have the capability of approving co-ops. Um, so to do that, uh, we, as a part of, the, part of the prioritization process, we surveyed, we sent a survey out to 600 plus groups to identify the common techniques, parameters, et cetera. Um, that folks were monitoring and to assess whether or not they had standard operating procedures, a study design, or a co-op in place. And then from there, we were able to identify the set of parameters that we were going to focus on integrating into the database, et cetera. And then we we're able to start grouping comparable techniques with each other. And every, you know, we can't find all techniques in one fell swoop of a survey. Um, but every time a new technique comes up that a group is using, you know, we then and try to like, you know, identify what the best QC measures are and et cetera, and, and place that all together. So I think if anyone else is considering like regional programs, the umbrella co-op approach, it's a good one. We're happy to talk even longer about it because co-ops are one of Liz's favorite things. Those were fantastic questions and responses. Um, and thank you to all of the presenters who are doing a great job responding to questions in the chat also. Uh, I believe I'll direct this next question to Peter. What other than funding do your programs need most? More volunteers, better sensors or protocols, data analysis, content for workshops, disseminations, etc. <laughs> That's a wonderful question. What do we need most? So I, I, I will answer that a bit with depending on two, two factors here. One, within the context of sustaining what we have and two, within the context of growing the program. And uh, we just came through a, an assessment of our overall, it, it was like the, the 10 year reassessment of our monitoring programs in the, in the Bay. And there were several science needs that were aligned with what it was likely to align with for resources in the CMC if it had some additional capacity. So we recognize that, uh, that the plates that are in front of us amongst the team here are pretty much at a certain level of resource capacity. And if we wanna grow, there's 
perhaps a new person, a little extra funding. So uh, not to get away from that, but the, the funding question, put that aside, but it does take a little bit of added capacity. However, that may come about to, to support the growth uh, beyond, for example, where we are today and consider things like aquatic vegetation monitoring, fish monitoring, other forms of, of watershed monitoring. Um, uh, on the, on the I, I think what I've seen from the program work here, teams are often interested in more equipment in order to help them achieve their goals and whether it's increasing the tier that they want to or getting the measurements that they want to. So at least for me, that kind of, that feels like an important leg of the stool that allows groups to, for themselves to get more of the information they want and better align with projects that are on the ground already. And uh, I don't think anybody anybody is lacking or, or wishing that they had less data analysis. They often really wanna understand the interpretation. So there's a, a strong need for being able to offer that kind of support in terms of interpreting what they have and telling the story so that everybody, they themselves get the, the um, feedback on the work that they're doing. So those are kind of three, one kind of on the sustain or a couple on the sustaining and one in the growth category that I think helps Couch uh, respond there. And Liz, team, do you have other perspectives there since I know you're I think, hour, hourly? <laughs> yeah, I think the hardest thing that we probably need the most is like that regional passion from our volunteers. Like the, the most uh, impact that we have is where we have those champions that are really taking ownership of their data and making an impact. And that's unfortunately it's something that like you can't just you know make happen with funding and grants and supplies. Um, that's something that's you know relationship building um, and trust building moving forward within our within our programs. So that's the hardest thing that we we need more of that we're constantly working towards. Awesome. So we kind of have a twofold follow up question about co-ops. Um, so. How successful are you at getting all the necessary QA, QC information for the work being done by citizen monitoring groups when they share or submit data? And then the second is, uh, do audits occur for the data collected by the CMC volunteers to ensure quality assurance protocols identified in the umbrella cloth are followed? Yeah, so I can, again, take a stab at this. Um, I answered a little bit in the chat box, but yes, the, the QAQC information is a requirement. So some groups, we acknowledge that some groups, it's all, they know they're doing the right thing and they have it all, you know, they're, they're out there doing it, but maybe it's not documented. Nobody thought to actually like write it down on paper of when the calibrations occur or when what kind of checks they're doing, that they're doing replicate samples at this particular frequency and things like that. So if they don't have the documentation in place, we work with them to make sure that they get the documentation in place. So again, that's one of the big things that we've tried to build is reducing those barriers to having sound, solid programs in place. We have templates, we provide the resources to kind of help them work through those processes. We will offer suggestions of things that they could do to kind of help um, increase the quality of their data um, and things like that. So it's we need to have we need to have the program documentation in place for them to upload data so that it, the appropriate metadata is, associated with all those data points and we know we know that quality. Yeah, and to, to add on to that, I think a significant role that the CMC service providers offer um, partners coming to the table is mentorship around how to increase uh, the quality of the, or the, the, the known quality of the data that they are collecting. And so as people are coming in and they're looking to have their data integrated into the data explorer, we have all sorts of doc, uh, documents that we as a team are sorting through, like Stephanie's got a smile on her face. She just went through this with Joyce McKay from Center County, KSEC. 
you know, where we're looking through all their data, we're looking through the metadata, we're looking at the SOPs, and it's an opportunity to be like, hey, have you thought about this? Um, so, hey, you're doing nutrient analysis. Are you doing a hydrochloric acid wash of your glassware? Hey, have you thought about introducing replicates and thinking through hold, you know, hold, you know, like this is a wonderful time for us to, to mentor and help elevate um, the data that are being collected and bring it to the standards that fit in with like the tiered framework and, and things like that. And I do think that, you know, as practitioners and as service providers, that's our role, right? Like that's our role to make sure that we're helping our volunteer scientists collect the best data as possible that shows up in our training, that shows up in the follow-up follow QC measures um, so that we're taking on the onus to streamline that process so that folks don't have to navigate and figure that out themselves on their own. And I do wanna add just one more point to this too, is that there's four service provider organizations who are working with the monitoring groups. We cannot possibly know every single method that's out there, every single piece of equipment that is, that's being used. So also one of the strengths is that we can connect groups who we know are using that same piece of equipment to work together to help um, answer questions or make sure that they understand the pieces of equipment that they're using. So we don't necessarily provide every single 100% of all of the answers, but knowing that, hey, this group over here is also using that piece of equipment and has probably had to troubleshoot that particular issue, we can make those connections and again, help, um, help all of the groups increase their quality assurance. So I'm just noting the time. So we did go one minute over and we can continue answering the questions. We're clearly very excited. I wanna keep talking. Um, so just wanna say thank you all so much for joining our webinar and taking an hour out of your day um, to hear about the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative. Um, and uh, stay tuned, the Volunteer Monitoring Work Group is already queuing up uh, its lineup uh, for 2023. Um, so stay tuned for some webinars then. And uh, we are happy to perhaps continue to answer a few more questions. If folks want to stay on the line, great. And if not, thank you so much. So you all have done a wonderful job covering most of the questions. I believe the only one left that has not at least been addressed in the chat is how do people sign up to volunteer? And the participant that asked this question is in Massachusetts. Um. Well, I, this would be a good time to link to our uh, get to work with CMC on the website. But sadly, we are um, limited to working within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. But in Massachusetts, there's so many fantastic programs. Um, let's find the email address. I'm happy to follow up with folks, depending on where you're located. There's a couple of programs that you could get connected to. Um, so I'm happy to try to find that and then uh, make some suggestions afterwards, but there's at least three strong um, programs in Massachusetts. So depending on where they're located. Um, I think Robert Smith has already responded to that in the <laughs> chat. So <laughs> he will get you. Yes. Um, Julie, the other question was just, will we capture all the resources that were shared in the chat? Hey, Sophie, can we capture all the resources that are shared in the chat? You got it. Hey, thank you. Yes. And then and then make those available along with the recording. So. Yeah, we, we can add that into the follow up email. Cool. And I think that's it. I think that's all the questions we have. All right. Cool. Yay. Well, thanks. well, thanks everyone for joining the webinar. And uh, we'll see you in 2023. Woohoo! Thanks, all. Soon.